all about Jesus. All about Jesus. All About Jesus is the audio ministry of Pastor John Hillebrand of Calvary Chapel in Bartlett, a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, God's Word, the Bible, is all about Jesus. Pastor John is currently teaching the church at Calvary Chapel, Bartlett, through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We are glad you have joined us today and invite you to open your Bible and your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit will send to us through the Word of God. And now, with today's message, here's Pastor John. Shall we open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 20? Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, where we read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, but the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is translated teacher, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Today we remember and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a day that is also called Easter. Now on this day, there are pulpits around the world that are boldly proclaiming that Jesus is risen from the dead. But yet there is also within the world a lot of confusion surrounding this day. For all throughout the land, bunnies and multicolored eggs, symbols of fertility, abound in baskets and in backyard hiding places. What do bunnies and eggs have to do with Jesus rising from the dead? And the confusion about Easter goes way beyond eggs and rabbits, which is illustrated in the following, I'm sure, true story. 
three atheists died in an attempt to jump the Grand Canyon in a 1977 Datsun B210. I had one of those, by the way. At the pearly gates, Peter told them they could enter into heaven if they could answer one simple religious question. Peter asked, what is Easter? The first atheist replied, oh, that's easy. It's a holiday in November when we all get together, eat turkey, watch football, and are thankful. Wrong, replied Peter. You are not welcome here. You must go to the other place. Then he turned to the second atheist and asked him the same question, what is Easter? The second replied, Easter is the holiday in December when we put up a nice tree, exchange presents, and celebrate the birth of Jesus. Peter looked at him in disgust, banged his heads on the pearly gates, and then told him that he also was wrong and must join his friend in the other place. Then Peter peered over his glasses and asked the third atheist, Do you know what Easter is? The third atheist smiled confidently and said, I know what Easter is. Easter is the Christian holiday that coincides with the Jewish celebration of Passover. After Jesus and his disciples had eaten the Last Supper, one of his disciples betrayed him and turned him over to the Romans. The Romans made him wear a crown of thorns and crucified him on a wooden cross by driving nails through his hand and his feet. After he died, he was buried in a nearby cave, which was sealed off by a large boulder. Well, at that point, St. Peter smiled broadly with delight until the third atheist continued, and he said, And every year the boulder is moved aside so that Jesus can come out. And if he sees his shadow, there will be six more weeks of winter. (laughs) Quite a bit of confusion about Easter, isn't there? Well, we're not confused, are we? No, today we remember, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most significant event to have ever taken place because everyone's Eternal destiny depends on whether or not they believe that Jesus is truly risen from the dead. You know, a person can go, believe it or not, I know this might be a blasphemous thing to say here in the Memphis area, a person can go his or her whole life without ever hearing the name Elvis Presley and be fine spiritually and go their whole life without ever hearing his name, knowing anything about him, and their eternal destiny will not be affected one bit. However... If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, a person doesn't know who he is and they, they don't believe that he is risen from the dead, in fact, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead at all, then we would all be without hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, if there's no afterlife, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead and there's no afterlife, therefore, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Sorry on us. Here we are trying to deny ourselves. And for what reason? If Jesus isn't risen from the dead, then we might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. But 1 Corinthians 15 goes on to say, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus is risen from the dead. Therefore, all who believe in him will also be raised unto eternal life. After Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible declares that he presented himself alive to many people on many various occasions for a period of 40 days. According to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. He made an appearance to a crowd of over 500 people after he had been risen from the dead. Of all the events that have taken place in the entire history of the world, the most significant event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because again, your eternity depends on whether or not you truly believe in and embrace by faith the resurrected Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Salvation is a free gift to all who would believe, all who would put their faith and trust in the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, 
We're going to look at the events of that first resurrection Sunday morning as told to us here in the Gospel of John. We will, not, we, will, we will notice that not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but all who came in contact with him were radically transformed, radically changed both for time and eternity. The first visitor to the tomb was a lady by the name of Mary Magdalene. Notice in verse 1, and Magdalene was the city she was from, Magdala, so they called her Mary of Magdalene. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, those of you who, who have studied the Bible, you know that Mary was the lady. Mary Magdalene was the one out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. She loved the Lord very much. And she had even been there when they crucified Jesus on the cross. She saw them crucify him and then watched him die. She came to the tomb that morning devastated, grieving bitterly because in her mind her Lord was still dead. But then when she saw that the stone had been rolled away, her sorrow turned to panic, turned to fear. Matthew's gospel tells us, gives us another bit of information about that first resurrection morning and why the stone was rolled away. In Matthew 28, verse 2, as the kids quoted to us earlier, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Apparently, the angel caused it, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The Roman soldiers were so terrified at the sight of this angel that they even fainted, which means that angels really look nothing like artists' renditions that we see today. Mike, would you show the first picture? Here's the scary gothic lady angel. (laughs) The next one. The fearsome angelic child in stone angel. The next one. The awesome chubby cartoon baby angels. Ooh, terrifying, isn't it? The next one. My favorite the intimidating, terrifying, big-headed baby angels. And then, that's it. Good enough. Well, I'm sure that if those big-headed baby angels had been there, the guards might have fainted out of laughing. You know, might have been just hysterically, ah, oh, passed out because they go, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, you know, sort of a thing. But no. Angels in Scripture are terrifying, awesome, fear-gripping beings. We read in the scripture that one angel in one night went out and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And we also read in, in Matthew 28 how that angel rolled the stone away, thus causing an earthquake. Pretty heavy, huh? Oh, that's a bad joke. Anyway, heavy angel earthquake. <laughs> My question, though, is why was the stone rolled away? Was it to let Jesus out? Was he knocking on the tomb? Help, let me out of here. Was that the case? No, not at all. You remember later on how the disciples had closed the doors, locked the doors, closed the windows, and then Jesus just appeared to them. He walked through walls. So wall and doors and windows couldn't keep Jesus out, neither could a stone. Why was a stone rolled away? Not to let Jesus out, but to let us in, that we might know that his tomb is now empty. I've been there to Jerusalem couple of times been to the garden tomb area and it's empty in fact they have a plaque that says he is not here he is risen indeed it's pretty cool not that the disciples put that plaque up there that's just the Israeli tourism industry did that so anyway the stone was rolled away to let us in Mary came to that tomb saw the stone had been rolled away and then she ran and came to Simon Peter verse 2 and the other disciple whom Jesus loved And said to him, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Notice John, the disciple, the one whom the Lord used to write this gospel. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wasn't bragging about his love for the Lord. He wasn't saying the disciple who loved Jesus more than the rest. 
But he was saying of himself, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. Not that Jesus didn't love the other guys. But John knew that Jesus loved him. You know, you and I, we can say the same thing about ourselves. Jesus said in John 15, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So if you believe in Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, you also can call yourself the disciple whom Jesus loves. So Mary came and told Peter and John someone had taken the Lord out of the tomb. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, John's referring to himself as the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. And they both ran together. I like this next part. The other disciple, John writing of himself, the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Being an ex-athlete, I really appreciate John for adding this. I guess you can say these things, add these details when you're writing the gospel. I outran Peter, you know. In heaven, I wonder if if John occasionally goes up to Peter and says, Hey, Slowpoke, how's it going? You know, (laughs) who knows? And he, John, runs to the tomb. He gets there first, and he's stooping down and looking in. So he's still on the outside. He hasn't entered in. He hasn't gone through that that opening there that leads to that big massive rock where the tomb was. He stooped down. He looked in. He saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. By the way, that Shroud of Turin thing, some of you might know about it, I don't believe that could remotely even possibly be the grave cloth of Jesus Christ because they would wrap his body in strips of cloth, not one big sheet like that. So they saw the linen cloths, the strips of cloths lying there in the shape of a body, but yet no body in it, still intact, meaning Jesus had just passed through it. Very cool, these resurrected bodies were going to have one day. And so Jesus just passed through it. John saw these linen cloths lying there, and yet he did not go in. John was a good Jewish boy. He knew that having contact with a tomb would make him ceremonially unclean. He knew, therefore, that it was not right, kosher, for him to go into a place where a dead body might be. That's why they would whitewash tombs to make sure that people wouldn't even step on the graves. Because if you accidentally did, if you came in contact with a grave, then you would become ceremonially unclean for a time. And so John did not do that. Peter, however, didn't care. Notice in verse 6, Peter, then Simon Peter came, following him. Again, he's adding that, following me, I won. And I'm surprised he didn't write, and huffing and puffing because the guy was fat and out of shape. You know, he didn't write that. But he went into the tomb. Peter comes, he rushes right in. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So we see Peter, true to form, just rushing in, boldly rushing in where angels fear to tread, without regard to ceremonial law whatsoever. To to Peter's credit, Jesus was much more important to him than a set of rules and regulations. Oh, not that we throw out rules and regulations. Not that we disregard the commandments. Oh, no. Jesus said, blessed are those who teach and and keep the commandments. But yet sometimes some people think that the meticulous, nitpicky things, the rules and regulations are, are so important that it's almost as if they forsake the Lord in order to maintain the rules and the regulations. In Peter's mind, it wasn't like that at all. He loved Jesus. He was concerned, worried about his body. Where could it be? He rushed right in. He wanted to see for himself. And he saw the scene. Notice how neat the scene was, the neatness of it, the grave cloths lying there, still in the form of Jesus' body, but yet compressed because the body was just gone. It wasn't a scene of of chaos. It wasn't a scene where they had stripped off these cloths and they were lying everywhere. No, they were just lying there. And the head handkerchief, neatly folded, 
in a place by itself. This was obviously not the work of grave robbers. For if grave robbers had decided to unwrap the body, the cloths would be strewn everywhere. And really, grave robbers would have just taken the body with the wrappings and all and left. Was not the work of the disciples either. For you know how the, uh, later on the Roman guards went back and, and said to the religious rulers that these angels came and they rolled the stone away and Jesus left the tomb and we fainted and they told the story, they told the truth, but the religious rulers didn't want the truth out, so they paid them off and say, just tell everybody you were sleeping and the disciples came at night and stole his body away. Well, it wasn't the work of the disciples because, again, the cloths are still lying there, neatly arranged, all intact. It proved that Jesus passed right through them and left them where he had been lying. Verse 8, then the other disciple, Peter's in the tomb. He's looking around. He's amazed. He's like, what's going on here? Then the other disciple, he follows in finally. John comes in. He went in also, saw and believed. Verse 9, for as yet they did not know or really understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't understand that. There were scriptures that spoke of Jesus rising from the dead. The Messiah would come, would suffer on the cross. Psalm 22, suffer on the cross. But yet he wouldn't remain dead. In Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, which is the abode of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. There would be no decay in the body of Jesus. It wouldn't be left in Sheol because he was going to rise from the dead, you see. So they didn't understand that. Why didn't they? Well, you remember early on how they were so fixated upon Jesus overthrowing the Roman government and all those who would have close relationships with him were going to have positions of rulership and authority and glory on this earth. And so they were all focused on glory. And when Jesus spoke of his own death, and his resurrection, that was the furthest thing from there. You're not going to die. Remember Peter saying, you will not surely die. You know, quit talking like this, Jesus. You will not die. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And that was the problem. They were all mindful of the things of man. Hey, what kind of a beautiful robe am I going to have when I rule and reign? What kind of crown am I going to have? What kind of a chariot am I going to drive when I become a, an important figure in Jesus' kingdom, overthrowing the Romans. They didn't understand that he had to die. Rise from that. They were looking for the conquering king, and Jesus will come as a conquering king. Make no mistake about it. But first, he had to come as a suffering savior. So, the disciples, verse 10, Peter and John, they left the tomb. They went away again to their own homes. And let me suggest that they left way too early. They should have stuck around. Maybe they heard the closing song and, and thought, that's it. God's done working. I'm out of here. They left in a hurry. Boy, did they miss out. I would encourage us that if we don't have to run, or run off right after the service, stick around. Talk to one another. Meet people. Fellowship with one another. There's even going to be food after the service. No reason to run off. Learn to fellowship because, believe it or not, God still moves after the closing song. In fact, it's amazing how sometimes even before service and many times after service, it's when we see the Lord really touching people's hearts. Somebody said, oh, I'm struggling in this area. Well, man, let's pray for you. And, and prayer occurs and it's such a beautiful, wonderful thing. See, the disciples left and that there's nothing left that was going to happen. It's over. Mary stuck around. Mary was blessed. Notice verse 11. Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And all of a sudden, she sees. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Mary was sad because in her mind, her Lord was not only dead, but missing. If your God is dead, or if your God is missing, or both, then you too, like Mary, should be weeping because a stolen, missing, dead God is not a good source of hope. Certainly nothing to trust in. So she said this, I don't know where he is now. Everything I hope for is now missing. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was Jesus. Why not? Well, she had been crying. Her eyes were all puffy. Tears, it's blurring her vision. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? You know, if, again, if you're seeking a dead Lord, a dead God, we too should be weeping. But she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. No doubt, in a way, she had heard him call her name on many times, many other occasions. Maybe it was with great tenderness and love. Mary. Something in his tone that she just knew it was Jesus. Now, if I had been there, I would have heard him say, John! <laughs> Knock it off! You know, or whatever. But at that point, she recognized him. Instantly, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher, great master, great teacher. And at that point, it's obvious in the scripture here that she grabbed on to Jesus, got him in a full Nelson or some other death grip and was not going to let go. In her mind, she was thinking, you got away from me once, but never again. And notice at the end, of the verse Jesus said to her, or in verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Why didn't Jesus want her to cling to him? Interesting question. Later on, we know that he invited the disciples to touch him. You remember? To Thomas, he said, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not... Be unbelieving, but believing. So he invited the disciples to touch him, to handle him. It wasn't that she clung to him. It was why she clung to him. Jesus did not want her to relate to him according to his earthly body. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read, Therefore, from now on, as believers in Jesus Christ from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't care about race or creed or color, nationality, anything like that. We regard no one according to the flesh. Your social status, your bank account, the car you drive, it matters nothing. We love everybody. That's what Christians are supposed to do. From now on, regard, we regard no one according to the flesh even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. No longer are we relating to Jesus in his physical body. And that's what Mary was doing at this point, was trying to relate to Jesus in his physical body. We even know that, that when she called out to him, she said, Rabboni, or Rabboni, meaning exalted teacher. She's even considering Jesus as her exalted teacher. And sure, he's that, but he's much more than just a great teacher. More than just an instructor of spiritual things. Jesus didn't want Mary to relate to him as a great teacher or even as a body to cling to. Jesus wanted her and us to know him as God the Son who paid for all of our sins on the cross and rose from the dead that we might be justified in his sight. Jesus does want us to cling to him, but not to his flesh. He wants us to, by faith, cling to him. So Jesus told Mary, turn me loose. <laughs> Let me go. Don't cling to me, but go. Now here's the instruction here. 
Notice she's already been changed. She's no longer crying and weeping and sobbing convulsively. Now she is overjoyed. Why? What's the difference? Jesus is alive. He's not dead anymore. He's alive. She has now come in contact with the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's made all the difference in the world. That's the difference that God makes in our lives. Those who have truly been born again. Those who have truly come to faith in Jesus Christ. The resurrected Jesus Christ. We know He's not dead. He's alive. He lives evermore. And He loves us. And He's still interested in our lives. And He's still working in us and through us. And He's given us the Holy Spirit whereby we might know Him and fellowship with Him. He's given to us His Word whereby we might know Him and make Him better known. We've been changed. We've been radically transformed. Why? Because Jesus is risen from the dead. I have a question. Have you seen a radical change in your life? Have you come in contact with the resurrected Jesus Christ. If not, this morning would be a great time to do so. After the the, uh, service, during the closing song even, just get up from where you are and come forward. There will be people here who would love to pray with you that you might receive Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, as your Savior and Lord. So Mary has changed. Rabboni, clinging to him. Okay, Mary, turn me loose. i got a job for you to do. That's how God works in our lives too. You've come to faith in me? Great. You're all excited. You're going to heaven. Your name's written in my book of life. Wonderful. Now, here's something you can do. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. That's interesting wording, isn't it? Why would Jesus say, my father and your father, my God, your God? Here I believe he's indicating to them that his relationship with the Father is different from ours. You see, he is the only begotten Son of God. And his relationship with the Father is is unique in that he's the only begotten Son of God. We, however, we can become adopted children, sons and daughters of God when we believe in Jesus. So our relationship with the Father is different than Jesus' relationship with the Father. And I think that's what he's saying here in this place. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. How, how do you think her emotions were at this time? I've seen the Lord. Was she sad? Was she depressed? Or was she overjoyed? Oh, no doubt overjoyed. She's thrilled, doing you know that jumping up and down song that the kids did earlier. She was excited. Jesus is risen from the dead. I have seen the Lord and he spoke these things to me. Once she knew Jesus was alive, everything in her changed. She went from sorrow to to joy, from tears to triumph, all because of coming into personal contact with the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Mary, the first one to see Jesus alive and also the first evangelist, the one who proclaimed the good news of his resurrection. You know, as we read through the other gospel accounts, we see also that the disciples, once they came in contact with Jesus, once they received him as their risen Savior and Lord, they also had an amazing transformation. Beforehand, they were hiding. They were fearful. But afterward, they went out and boldly proclaimed that Jesus is risen from the dead. Ever since then, all who have clung to the resurrected Jesus Christ by faith have also been radically changed and transformed for time and eternity. Again, the question this morning is, has Jesus changed you? Do you truly believe in him? If so, he has changed you. If you don't see that transformation, though, then you might want to come forward for prayer. You might want, maybe there's something you're still holding on to. Maybe some belief, some idea that is not consistent with the Bible. Do you really believe Jesus is risen from the dead? Once you do, you too will be changed. Jesus said in John 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, 
he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus said. Do you believe this? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Hey, his resurrection proves that he was telling the truth. Again, all who clung to him by faith had that amazing transformation. Has the resurrected Jesus Christ transformed your life today? Let's pray. Lord, we do just want to cling to you by faith. We want to shout out, not just Rabboni, but Savior, Master, King, Lord, God. Thank you, Jesus, for rising from the dead. Thank you, Lord, that through your resurrection we are justified. Even though we know the truth about ourselves, you don't know our sins any longer. They're gone. They're removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Lord, you've washed our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood you shed on the cross is payment in full. And Lord, you're risen from the dead. Lord, we all pray for that radical transformation, that holy boldness to go forth from this place and tell others that you're alive. You're not dead. You're risen from the dead. And you're alive and you want to come in everybody's hearts. You want to be everybody's master and savior and Lord. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you. And we worship you. In our hearts, we express love to you. With the words of our songs, we express love and gratitude and devotion unto you. Thank you, Jesus, for rising from the dead. We believe. Believe in you. And change our lives, O Lord. According to your will, change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're glad that you could join us today for our study of God's Word. If you would like to have a cassette or CD copy of today's Bible study in its entirety, mail your request with the date of this broadcast and the scripture reference to Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. That address again is Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. Our service times are Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m., Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are located in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett at 8587 Memphis Arlington Road. For more information about Calvary Chapel Bartlett, please call us at area code 901-385-3854. That number again is area code 901-385-3854. You may also visit us online at calvarychapelbartlett.com. Again, that's calvarychapelbartlett.com. Our hope and prayer is that we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again at this same time, Monday through Friday, as we continue to study the entire Bible, which is all about Jesus. All about Jesus.